There is no one like our God. No one like our God. It is unfathomable to the world. You see, uh, to the Jews, our God is a stumbling block. And to the Greeks, the cross is utter foolishness. But to those of us that know him, it is the power of God to save. Listen to Isaiah 53. You see, there was nothing stately about him, his form, that you should uh, look upon him, nor his appearance, that you would ever be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him strict smitten of God and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastising of our well-being fell upon him, for by his scourging we are healed. Who is humble like our God? Is there any? Could there ever be any? To leave the throne of heaven and be born in a manger, in a feeding trough, to a poor peasant family. Not in Jerusalem, not in, not in the, the palace, not even to a noble family, but to a young virgin. There wasn't even room in Bethlehem. Who is like our God? See, I want you to mentally press into this idea. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Because who is like our God? Who would be so humble to not only take the, become a man, but to become a humble man of meager circumstances and even further to submit himself to death on a cross. We've been walking through the book of Ephesians. We're in the middle of chapter 5. Last week, picking up in verse 18, he began to talk about, instead of being filled by all the worldly things, okay, you have a heart that is constantly hungering for something. He says, be filled by the Spirit of God. And in verses 18 through 21, he begins to talk about the evidence, the overflow of what it looks like to be filled with God's Spirit. He says, uh, he says, first of all, that you, your heart bursts into song. You sing the promises of God. You speak the truth of God's promises one to another. Second, that you are thankful in every situation. Why? Because we have the promises of God. And God's promises are true, and we are filled with hope. And then thirdly, this evidence, this overflow of the Spirit is there is this Humility and submission in our lives. Now, it's that unfolding of submission that he, he is, is the catalyst. Verse 21 is the catalyst for this entire next section of the book of Ephesians as he walks through the evidence of the Spirit and this attitude of submission that exists in Christians' lives. And in particular, in the most important areas in our home, with the relationship between husband and wife, parent and child, and then in the workplace, as it overflows in our lives. So as we pause and think about where submission comes from, I also want to draw your attention to the fact that we get to take the Lord's Supper today. 
And so the the whole time as we're walking through the sermon, hear, hear me, do not check out by saying, I'm not married, therefore this doesn't apply to me, or I'm a man, therefore I can do whatever I want. Why? Because what you will see is that submission and humility are within God himself And every one of us as Christians are called to live a life that overflows with this humility. And as we move towards the Lord's Supper, examine yourself. Examine yourself. Because it will ultimately be a picture of of the church submitting and honoring our Lord and Savior. So Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. Wives, be subject or submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as Christ is subject, sorry, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we love your word. Father, I can almost sense across the room a nervousness, a, a, a tension, a fast heartbeat. Would your Holy Spirit right now in Jesus' name just calm us and allow us to hear your word. Father, we trust you. We trust you. You have given your son for us. All of your instruction to us is for our good. It's for our good. Lead our hearts. Lead our hearts to understand you more. We pray all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. A few years back, I was in a a small cohort of pastors that meet every year, actually in Comfort, Texas. It's It's a bunch of Aggie pastors that gather together. We call ourselves CAPS. And uh, I was in this cohort for a, a weekend of pouring into each other. When the news broke that a journalist had combed through uh, some old sermons from Paige Patterson, then the president of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He had combed through uh, some sermons that were about 25, 30 years old and came across a rather striking story that was alarming. An abused woman had come to him with a black eye. She was clearly physically abused. And she said, Pastor, what do I do? His instructions to her were, begin to pray every night at your husband's feet and show submission to him. Now, needless to say, well, in this story particularly, God used the prayers of this wife, broke through, he got saved, and the story was given as an example of heroic faith of submission and prayer and lifted up. Well, needless to say, in this particular incident, the discovery of this 20 years later, it was kind of culturally shocking. And even horrific advice for someone who's in the middle of an abusive relationship. Well, that story would set off a national news story that would ultimately lead to the removal of Paige Patterson as the past, or of the president of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Now, I remember the details of this because I happened to be in that cohort with one of the trustees who was on that board. And we spent the remainder of the evening just praying over him and praying for God's wisdom for how to handle this. Now, I referenced the incident 
Because as soon as I read a passage like this, culturally, we have been trained to run to the extremes. We run to very difficult counseling situations and want to apply this passage with a blanket statement using zero situational wisdom. And therefore, our culture wants to completely throw it off and run to the opposite extreme and say, well, then there are no genders, there are no gender roles, all of that's bad. Therefore, I need to spend the first portion of this sermon choosing my words very carefully and setting up guardrails, if you will, on the sides so that then we will actually be free to hear God's word and to hear the life that it brings. So bear with me. It's very important for us to distinguish between suffering and abuse. Suffering is discomfort that occurs in every marriage. And can range from he doesn't listen to me, he works all the time, to he is the worst, loudest snorer in the history of the world. Okay, you ever had someone that's kind of a scream snorer? I've had counseling situations where we sleep on opposite ends of the house because he's such a loud snorer. Abuse means that someone is being physically or mentally harmed with lasting damage. Every marriage suffers discomfort. And yes, I know it can be difficult to draw the exact line from when you, when you move over from, from suffering to abuse, but that requires God's wisdom, okay? Wisdom means being able to apply knowledge with discernment into difficult situations in life. That's what wisdom is. Not, not you just throw over a categorical blanket statement. So listen to me, if you come to me and you tell me you are being abused, number one, I will tell you, get out and get safe. Number two, I will tell you, get help. Invite godly counseling and wisdom into the situation, into both parties. And number three, I will tell you, let us pray and let us spend time so that God can either heal or separate. There was a couple at my last church that came to me, this very situation. He was abusive, he was an alcoholic. There had been some abuse that had gone on. She separated, and then the two of them began to walk through counseling. I will tell you, there were some very, very, very dark moments in the middle of that situation where I, I, I thought, I, I knew this was going to end in divorce. And God broke through. Amen. God saved him and redeemed and reconciled their marriage. And it was powerful, it was powerful. And I wish with every fiber of my being that every situation ended that way. But the truth of the matter is is it doesn't. Now there's another truth that I need to spotlight clearly for us. You see, the idea of submission and humility are intricately linked. But they so commonly have a very poor definition. Being humble and submissive does not mean being a doormat. This is a mischaracterization of a godly attribute. Passively allowing sin is not humility. Having low self-esteem and being discouraged is not biblical submission, right? Eeyore is not our example of you're supposed to be like that. You see, Jesus humbled himself. He was born in a manger to a poor family. He even humbled himself to being scourged, to a crown of thorns, to being mocked, to being hung naked on a cross, 
And never once did he think less of himself. Never once did he deny that he was the son of God. Never once was he a doormat. See, our culture wants to paint with a broad brush, a brush that's so wide that they can run to polarizing extremes. If we say that all men abuse power and everything is toxic, then we can run to polarizing conclusions, that there are no such thing as genders and and there should be no gender roles. But that's a blind leap. Is there such a thing as abuse of power and toxic masculinity? Absolutely. And for that matter, Christians should be the first to point it out and run to the aid of those who are hurting and being abused. But should we then deny that there is any created order by God himself? Say there is no truth in that? No, that's absurd. Well, well, submission means uh, inferiority. If you say that we do not have the same function, then you are saying that we do not have equal value. False. You don't have to look any further than the Godhead himself. Where 1 Corinthians uses the same word, submission of the Son to the Father. And the Holy Spirit, whose entire ministry is to highlight and spotlight the Father and the Son. You see, there is, create, there is order God creates out of himself. So when we think, when we talk about this idea of humility and submission, you must understand where it comes from. God himself. So here's what we have to do. Church, we have to put this passage back in its context and read it within the entire movement of the book of Ephesians. You don't just pull it out and read it over here to the side and proof text, right? We've been walking through this book together. And when you put it together, you're able to hear and the word of God brings life. Paul has already argued how the gospel has torn down the dividing walls between Jew and Gentile, creating a third race, a new people. Is he now going to reconstruct dividing walls between all, and all these other areas? No. In fact, recognize that Paul addresses each party giving each of them instruction. Recognize that when he addresses husbands, it's three times longer than when he addresses wives. Recognize that he has pressed for two chapters for us to be the living temple, the church, the body, and that we need each other and that we're supposed to hold each other accountable, that there's supposed to be this mutual submission to one another, that we're not supposed to run back to our old toxic patterns in life, but rather that we're supposed to be filled by the Holy Spirit of God. That's the context here. Be filled by the Spirit of God. And when the Spirit is there, there is this humility and submission. And then Paul, you can, you can imagine his mind immediately starts to, he wants to show you what that looks like in our lives. And he burst into this section about marriage where Christians are supposed to picture this God-ordained structure and, and he just burst into this glorious picture. You see, yes, he defines and articulates roles, but he explodes into a much larger discussion, idea that permeates the whole section. In fact, you cannot understand what he's talking about if you don't see and realize that marriage is a picture of Jesus' relationship to the church. 
Wives, submit to your husbands as the church submits to Christ. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. There's an illustration that I use at almost every wedding, so I'll share it with you this morning. Imagine that Lane and I decide that we want to take a trip to the Grand Canyon, which, by the way, is a 17-hour drive from here in Bernie. Now, with my kids and the uh, about 15-minute bladders that we have, we would probably change that trip to about a 33-hour drive, nonetheless. I I need you to imagine how many times I have heard, when are we going to be there? And he's touching me. When's he going to stop touching me? (laughs) So we make it. We get there. The five of us have driven. We are at the Grand Canyon, the national park, and we, we pull up and we go into the headquarters, the park ranger station. We get out and we spend hours through the gift shop, pulling out maps and looking at pictures Magnificent pictures. We're we're looking at it, we're pointing at it, and we're like, man, that is beautiful. Do you see that? Hey, hey, Ian, do you see that? And after spending hours at that park ranger station, we get back in our car and we head back to Bernie. (laughs) Never going 10 extra minutes to see the Grand Canyon itself. That is what it is like, Christian, to talk about marriage, to focus on marriage, but to never see the connection between Christ and the church. To never see the real thing, the real substance, that our marriages are a picture of the gospel, that our roles are a picture of the gospel, that the most powerful tool that God has given to any Christian is their marriage and their family unit and the most intimate relationships that you have in all of life because they picture the order that is within God himself and the gospel of Jesus Christ the son to the church. That's the picture. It is like the picture of the Lord's Supper pointing us to the gospel, what he has done for us. You see, marriage, uh, uh, sorry, you see the whole world struggles with marriage because it's hard, because it's really hard. But there is supposed to be this difference amongst Christians. The world is supposed to look and say, marriage is hard, but what is the secret? What do you guys have in there that makes it so vibrant, so different? We want that. And we would say back to the world, oh, you you see, our relationships, our homes, they are a picture of God's love to us. They are a picture. We see the connection. We see the purpose. We are willing to love as Christ loved. We are willing to submit as the church does to Christ. You see, the whole thing is a picture. That's where we get our motivation. That's where we get our passion. That's why it overflows out of us. And it becomes compelling, so much so that the lost world says, how do I get that? Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is also head of the church 
he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be subject to their own husbands in everything. Submission is humble recognition of divine order. I'm going to say that again. Submission is humble recognition of divine order. Every woman is not asked to submit to every man. This is within the home. And the Greek word here for submit, it's in the middle voice. Recognizing that it has to be voluntary submission. Ladies, it's an appeal to your free will. As Christians who wish to walk worthy. Wives, take on the attitude of the church towards Christ. And the church towards Christ says, thank you for loving and protecting and saving me. The church towards Christ says, I trust you and I want to honor you. Jesus, your presence is truly what matters. I don't want anything else. I don't want riches or things of this world. Jesus, I want you. I want to know you. I want to honor you. Gratitude, honor. I want to know you. You say, well, pastor, my husband doesn't act like Jesus and therefore he doesn't deserve to be treated like Jesus. You know how many marriage counseling situations stop at that one impasse, right? Love her. Well, she doesn't honor me. Honor him. Well, she doesn't, uh, she doesn't honor. Uh, I mixed it all up, sorry. <laughs> love her. She doesn't honor me. Honor him. Well, he doesn't love me. Who's going to act like Christ first? Who's going to humble themselves and act like Christ first? Listen to me. The attitude and condition of your heart does not depend on him. It doesn't say submit to him if he doesn't get on your nerves. (laughs) Rather, submit as unto the Lord. You see, your submission is to Jesus. Listen to me, wives. This is your power source. This is your power source. You want your prayers to radiate and reverberate around the throne of heaven. This is your power source. This isn't me saying it. This is God himself. 1 Peter 3.1. In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands so that, it, so that if any of them are disobedient to the word, right? You pause there. You say, Amen. They may be one without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. This is your power source. Why? Because you're saying, I trust you, God. Look, you can nag him or you can pray for him. There's a great book by Jimmy Evans. Uh, called Marriage on the Rock. He's a longtime 
a marriage counselor and a former longtime pastor. And he tells a story about uh, at his church, he was having a Valentine's banquet for couples. And, and he had asked a, uh, a particularly uh, older couple that were very distinguished. They were very much in love. They were this model example. He had tapped them on the shoulder and said, hey, could you at this uh, Valentine's banquet, could you stand up and could you give your testimony and just kind of really energize those younger couples? Well, he was rather shocked when this distinguished couple, and she stood up and she said this, with her loving, godly, distinguished husband standing next to her, she told how at the beginning of their marriage, he was a lousy husband. She said, when we first married, my husband didn't know how to manage money. In addition, we were broke. Uh, he, he never spent any time with me at home. He worked all the time. He was insensitive to my needs, and he never prayed or led us spiritually. Those, those were not only her negative comments about her husband. However, he spoke as she spoke, he stood there and smiled the whole time, proudly by her side. He said, I couldn't believe it. I didn't know what was happening here. But then she concluded with these remarks that a godly woman's that every woman needs to hear. When my husband and I began to have all of our troubles early in marriage, I knew I had a choice to make. I could nag him and try and change him. I could leave him. But in my heart, I knew that none of those things was right. So I finally decided to give him room to fail and let God correct him as I honored and loved him. And after a period of time of praying for him and letting him fail, I began to see God change my husband right before my very eyes. Today, I have a wonderful husband who loves me and meets my needs. Ladies, I did not find this man this way as he is today. And I didn't, and we didn't get there by nagging or demanding. I gave him the room to fail as I prayed for him and treated him with honor. So let's get real for a moment. I know I'm painting with a broad brush, but if I had to tell you the most common dysfunction of a wife in marriage is a dominant wife. That which was promised and foretold in Genesis 3 Verse 16, to Eve, your desire will be for your husband. That word desire there means uh, to, to rule over, to have authority over. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. You see, there's going to be a battle from the very beginning. That's what was lost in the garden. The dominant wife is impatient with her husband's lack of leadership. So she grabs control and unknowingly emasculates him and how she talks to him. She's a quick thinker and a quick speaker, taking advantage of his more mild temperament. What she doesn't realize is that whenever he gets the time to collect his thoughts, she resents the way that she dishonors him and doesn't let him lead. He longs to prove himself as a man to win her honor, if only she would support him. Lacking a sense of masculinity, he often retreats, distances himself, pressing into hunting or working or drinking or playing video games, vices on the internet, and it becomes a vicious cycle. Dominant wives... The scripture appeals to you. Confess and repent. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Have the Spirit of God give you an attitude of submission and strength and patience and pray for him and trust the Lord 
Much of your dominance comes out of fear of what would happen if you let go of control. Yes, you are the helpmate, but do you trust God enough to give your husband the room to fail and to grow into the spiritual leader that you deserve? And he's not off the hook, right? We're coming to him next week. (laughs) Now, many of you older ladies know exactly what I'm talking about. Because you've been there. And so church, let me ask you, who is going to teach and walk alongside the younger generation? Who's going to help them steer between the guardrails and keep this thing on the tracks? Who's going to walk alongside them if it's not you? Because there are so many confusing voices in our culture. Now I want you to go ahead and I want you to grab the Lord's Supper. And we started, we prefaced with this truth that honor and submission is ultimately a picture of the church to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the church says to Christ, thank you. Thank you for loving and saving and protecting me. I trust you, Jesus, and I want to honor you. I want you, Lord, more than any other thing. I want you and I need you that you and I would be filled with gratitude and honor for our Lord and Savior. So we get to take the Lord's Supper, a picture of the gospel. Hear me today. This is for baptized, born-again believers. Parents, please regulate your children. This is for those of us that know him and have come into an intimate relationship with him. Otherwise, it's just bread and juice. But to those of us that know him, it's a picture of his broken body and his shed blood. And it means everything to us. And so you go ahead and work on the bread and I want you to get it out. I want you to hold it in your hand. Who am I that you would be so mindful of me, Lord, such as to be broken for me? Who am I that you would have your beard plucked out, that you would have a crown of thorns smashed down on your head, that you would be scourged, your back shred open, that you would carry a cross up Golgotha, that you would be stripped of your clothes and hang in naked shame upon the cross. Who am I? Church, we want to keep short accounts The scripture tells us, don't take this in an unworthy manner. But because of his love for us, we kneel in our hearts and we confess and we keep short accounts. So I'll give you right there in your pew a few moments to kneel in your heart of hearts to confess your sins to your Lord and Savior so that when we take this together in a moment, it is not in an unworthy manner.
While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. Now won't you grab the cup? What I love about the elements of the Lord's Supper is the cup carries with it an element of victory, an anticipation of that day when we will see him again. You see, his body was broken. And we do say, who am I that you would be mindful of me? But we hear his voice. He is the one who freely laid down his life. He is the one who pursued us when we were his enemies. He is the one who breaks free, who awakens us from the dead. He is the one who first humbled and submitted himself to death on a cross to win us back to himself. And now there is a cup that, that he holds and says, I will not drink this again until I am with you. He is the one who loves us and pursues us and never gives up, never stops. He never leaves us in our sin. The moment that we humble ourselves in our heart, that we kneel at the foot of the cross, we hear, you are forgiven. How good is that? How magnificent is that? So in your heart of hearts, as you sit there with a cup in front of you, as you think about his new covenant in his blood, as you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God, think of the victory. And hear his voice saying to you, come, you are forgiven, you are free, you are redeemed. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you are so good. You are so humble. You are, you are not like us, and yet you have given us a heart, and you have given us a desire. We want to be like you. You have a love. You have a pursuit. You have, you have a humility and a strength. You, you know all things, God. We want to be like you. We want to walk with you. We pause right now to just say thank you. Thank you. Who are we that you would be mindful of us and yet you have freely given, you pursue. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we pray for our marriages. We pray for our wives. that they would be filled with your Holy Spirit and display your power and strength that the world finds a stumbling block and it finds absolute foolishness through submission. Heavenly Father, we pray for us as a people and as a church because that command does not only go to our wives, it goes to each and every single one of us in our lives, that our lives would be filled with a humility and a submission. That that would be the culture and the atmosphere of this church because we are filled with you. That we would submit one to another. 
that we would respect authority in our lives and that that power and that strength would come from you. Jesus, help us to walk as you walked. It's in your name we pray. Amen.